Great. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's. Can you hear me? Uh, I got some noise here. Okay. Cool. All right. So we're gonna get started now. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. So welcome to today's CNC webinar, SMP Experience Report, the multi-cloud service on Knative. So my name is Daniel o. I'm working for Red Hat as a technical marketing major, but also I'm responsible for CNC investor. So luckily I will be moderating today's webinar. So we'd like to welcome our awesome presenter, Ivan Anderson, software engineer and VMware, and Mark Wang, uh, head of cloud engineering and SMP global ratings. Uh, there are a few, a uh, couple of things of housekeeping items before we get started. So during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. So, but there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your question in there and then we will get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of CNCF. So please, and uh, this is a subject to CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add any, anything of the chat or a question box uh, would it be a violation of the code of conduct. So please be respectful for all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that uh, the recording and slides that will be posted later today at the CNCF webinar page, uh, www.cncf.io slash webinar. And uh, with that, I'll, I will hand, you, hand it over to Evan and Mark. Take it away. Hi. So mm -hmm. as I was introduced, um, I'm Evan Anderson from VMware, and um, I'm one of the TOC members on the Knative project, and I've been working it for the last couple of years. And we recently had an opportunity to work with Mark at, um, at uh, S&P Global um, on actually rolling out an implementation of Knative. And so I'm going to let Mark introduce himself a little bit. Thank you, Daniel and Evan. Um, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So my name is Mark Wong. I have the privilege to run cloud engineering at S&P Global Ratings. So like Evan introduced, um, so we have a current existing relationship with VMware. And once we selected the technology of Knative for our multi-cloud serverless implementation, then we started working with um, Evan and the team. It's been a great collaboration, and uh, you know our goal today is to just share our experience on this journey. And um, you know the talk to me it sounds like it's almost like 100 level. So I'll go through some 100 level, and then 200 level developer experience, and then Evan's going to get down to the nitty gritty details, the 300 level um, content. So Evan, anything before we start? Um, oh, I was just going to say that. Um, you know, when we started this a couple of years ago, it was, you know, kind of a dream that, hey, all the pieces were coming into place that you could actually run a serverless solution on your own infrastructure without having to build all of the pieces yourself. So you didn't need to build your own scheduler. Kubernetes had one of those. You didn't need to build your own HTTP routing. Envoy had that. And so it's exciting to see um, companies like SP actually taking that last step of not just having the software, but actually having a platform that they can build and customize um, to their own needs. And it's been great working with them um, to be able to get that to happen. And with that, um, I'm gonna let Mark talk a little bit about how things actually, uh, you know, how S&P actually decided to do a serverless platform. Right. So when you think of serverless technology, right, some of the basic things come to mind. One is you don't have to manage infrastructure. And the other is the speed to market, right? And cost is another, you know, because of the compute density, right? So you're not using machines, you're using everything packed into containers and even functions, right? So why do we go to a function as a service? To me, the biggest benefit is we can ship software faster, right? So I'll go through more of our background in terms of our technology portfolio. But if we look at the overall goal, right? So why do we want to adopt fast function as a serverless, uh, function as a service or serverless technology, right? It's to ship our products faster. So we wanna move from monthly quarterly releases to weekly or daily releases, right? So release frequently. So that's one of the benefits from serverless technology which is that 
teams, scrum teams can focus on the business logic and not worry about infrastructure, worry about coding standards, worry about vulnerabilities. A lot of those will be taken care of. I'll show a little bit more about that. And then the other thing is that they can own more of their staff, right? So they don't have to depend on this team or that team. So the automation and the pipeline will take care of a lot of that. So they have true CI CD experience, right? They can release code as soon as they're ready to any environment they would like. And the other benefit is that after we break down the monolith and build more and more functions, take out more key capabilities, then we end up retiring our legacy monolithic applications. So less technology we have to worry about. And one of the things in our journey that we found is that as we moved along, you know, Knative is a new technology, even Kubernetes is a new technology for us. So for us to have this global FADS initiative, we really needed to transform our culture. So one of the things we noticed as we moved along is that we partner with our application developers because the subject matter expertise for Python, for .NET, for Angular, and for other technologies resides with application teams, right? So these, we, we have a open kind of development, open collaboration model where the engineers can contribute to the platform. I'll show you more detail about that. And then when they contribute, they kind of unblock themselves as well. It's almost like a kind of win-win situation. They're building shared features on the platform. Meanwhile, they're unblocking themselves and they're enabling their peers to do more on the platform. So if we go to the next slide, okay. So this is a background. Um, so 2020, one of our five strategic initiatives is to be certified on function as a service. So if you look at our portfolio two years ago, where majority is on-prem, and then last year over a period of nine months or eight months, we migrated 100% to the cloud. That migration was kind of a learning experience and the culture change in itself. If you think about our company, right, SMP is a financial, a trusted financial institution in, in, um, in the world, right, globally. So we've been around for 160 years. And today we're moving at the speed of FinTech. So last year, 2019, by mid 2019, over a period of eight months, we have migrated 100% to the cloud. And today we're benefiting from that, right? With COVID, with remote working, we enjoy stability and freedom in the cloud, right? So what is our next leap? So the team gained a lot of confidence from this experience to move to the cloud. And just a little bit more background on that, right? So while we are doing the move migration, mass migration to the cloud, we went through insourcing as well as agile transformation. So there's a lot going on culturally, but with clear leadership and dedication of our teams, as well as ingenuity from our engineers. So a lot of people don't know the cloud at that time, right? When we started the journey on the project, there was just one and a half cloud engineers. I count myself as half of the engineer. So we slowly built up the team internally. We didn't really get much help from outside other than we partnered with VMware uh, to use a VMC solution for some of the VM workloads. So we took, so after that experience, we gained a lot of confidence. And then going into 2020, we said, let's take a leap and go all the way to function as a service. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you a little bit of that journey. In terms of the roadmap, right? So we did a market research on what are our options to go to function as a service. Lambda is the first one that comes to mind, right? And then Azure Functions. So we evaluated those as well as other open source solutions besides Knative. And then we came up, came to the conclusion that Knative really gives us a cloud independence and the multi-cloud capability that we want. And there's a lot of smart engineers like Evan that you know, back up the active community behind Knative. So towards the beginning of this year, we started experimenting Knative. So if you look at the first swim lane, so we experimented with Knative and then by end of Q1, in partnership with Evan and team, we were able to release our first version of function as a service platform. 
and then we were able to release a handful of applications to the cloud uh, to to production and then the other uh, the third swim lane is really a, around adoption right so regarding that benefit we talked about earlier that goal of ship, shipping product faster right so to for us to be able to ship product faster we need mass adoption so we came up with a concept of certification right so bronze silver and gold so the certification really is to measure the maturity of application teams so bronze is a goal for 2020 it's really to make sure teams know how to do function as a service using Knative. And then they understand how to scale up, scale down. So we have certification meetings, we make sure the teams are certified. And then they understand what is their roadmap? How can they break capabilities out of the monolith to put into serverless? So if you think about it, silver really is to break out more high value capabilities out of the monolith and put it onto Knative, right? And then when we get to gold, we will have a consolidated portfolio of capabilities. And we will also retire a bunch of duplications and monolithic applications. At that time, when we reach gold, we'll be completely on function of the service using Knative. And let's go on to the next slide. So this is kind of a, a release view of the platform itself. So we, majority of the responsibility of my team is to enable the application teams and strong teams to be able to onboard their use cases. Like I talked about earlier, we really opened it up. We had nine work streams, engineers from different areas or were helping collaborating and moving this thing along. So every month we'll have a platform release. So MVP one was that we have a base platform, right? So we have Kubernetes, we have Knative, we have Vistio, we have Azure DevOps for CI CD, and then we have a set of pilot applications. So that was able to go live. And then we also defined this model to collaborate with engineers from different groups. And then fast forward to 2.0. So 2.0 was released in Q2. At that time we had 24 by seven support and then we have introduced OIDC as a standard for authentication. We have logging, monitoring, onboarding automation as well. I'll show you some of that in the demo. And we have CICD uh, pipeline automation. So at this time, we opened it up by 2.0 Q2, we opened it up for mass adoption. And we introduced the reference implementations. I'll show you a little bit of that in the demo as well. And in Q3, we are, going through more maturity. So now we have Knative function as a service running in DMZ. So we have external facing application that's using this capability now. And we have distributed tracing and we're using spot instance for our, uh, all of our clusters. And we also introduce con containers, right? Container as a service, because not everything can go to Knative, right? We have commercial off the shelf products that we, we don't manage the code for. And we also introduce container security. For us to go to DMZ, we, we wanna make sure um, our images, our runtime is, is secure. We can go to the next slide. All right, so some highlights on the features. So we support currently these languages for our developers, Java, .NET, Python, and Angular. And then for eventing, we support Kafka as well as ActiveMQ. And for security, we have TwistLock, we have open policy agent and Fortify is for our uh, static code analysis. And then on observability side, we have logging. So one of the things is um, the developers for productivity, right? They don't have to worry about logging into anything, right? There's obviously no machines. They don't have to care about where the container runs. They have full visibility with logging and monitoring. And we added distributed tracing as well with uh, open telemetry. And like I said, we're using um, spot instances. I think one thing I wanna highlight here, uh, maybe in a later slide is we do blue green cluster automation. So we'll, we'll go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. Yeah, so some of the major components, right, is we're using EKS, currently Amazon. And this technology is completely portable on other cloud providers as well, right? We're currently using Alibaba and as well as we're gonna start using Azure. 
So because it's built on Kubernetes and because Knative is built on Kubernetes, all these will be portable as well. And we're using a lot of automation, right? Like I talked about blue green. So every month when we release, we will build a whole new color cluster, right? From dev all the way onward. The reason why we do that is we wanna make sure everything is automated. And we wanna also make sure we respond to the changes in the base underlying Knative and Istio features very quickly, right? Because the, the technology is changing very quickly. We wanna be up, up to date with the underlying technology. And uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is a um, kind of a quick view for our developer experience. So we have local environment capabilities. So if developer wants to set up local developer experience with building the image locally and running the image locally, they can do that. And we also have pipeline with standards built, built in and automation built in as well. So once they go through the pipeline, let's say they deploy the code to dev, then immediately that is, uh, the image is shipped to our artifactory image repository, and then it's put into uh, Kubernetes through Knative and uh, accesses through Istio. So why don't we jump to the demo? So I'll give you a look, look at this. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So we want this to be as self-service as possible, right? So this is a view of our documentation. So we have a getting started guide that Scrum teams can come in and use it to get onboarded, help themselves with uh, CICD, Secret Manager. And then we set up a meeting with them in 30 minutes, they can get going. And we cut down our onboarding time from when we started in MVP one, it took like an, a week for a team to onboard a function. So now it takes about two hours. So I'll show you a little bit of that experience. So part of it is- Not all two hours. What was that? Not all two hours of the experience. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'll make it quick. It's gonna be much un less than two hours. Um, so, starts with documentation and uh, the onboarding automation I talked about. So in Jenkins, right? So based on the different types of reference implementation. So for example, if you're a Java application, we'll create this template. So we'll fill in all the details that you need. And then once you run it, we're going to build the reference implementation. So think about the reference implementation as the best practices and the standards built in. So once we run through this pipeline, it's going to create that reference implementation into a template for you. And I executed this um, for, my, for our demo here. So for example, I have a demo repository called demo mark rest. So it's a restful function and it's a Java function, right? So we have code reviewers, we have um, other team members, and we have secret manager defined here. So after we run this, what it will do is it's going to create a, um, a reference implementation here. So if you look at this, this comes sort of out, out of the box, right? So you have a reference implementation, you know all the monitoring, the log, and the documentation comes out of the box as well. So all you have to do then is to cut and paste your code into it. I'll, I'll go through a couple of the components of this, right? So since this is a Java function, we have a POM file. So POM file def defines your dependencies for Java, right? And then we have a Docker file. This, these all come out of the box. And then you see this Docker file has my function name built into it. And then it's, we use a base image for Java, for example. And then we use other base images for uh, different reference implementations. And we then have a pipeline file. So this pipeline file is important because we use uh, ADO, Azure DevOps, and this defines what goes into the pipeline. So for this pipeline, for example, I turned off the Fortify, right? Because we don't want to run this for like 10 minutes because Fortify is going to scan the code. And I turned off a couple of other things in here as well. For example, um, you can, all these things are configurable. So you can turn these on and off. So for example, I turned off some of the QA automation. So you can have CI, CD, and CT built into this, right? 
And as part of certification, we make sure that you have code coverage, you have continuous testing as well, as well as you know, sanity tests, smoke tests, regression testing, right? So these are all configurable. You can turn on and off. For this demo, I turned on the um, observability. So I wanna kind of show you that. And the other important file is service YAML. So this is the Knative file. So in here, developers have full control over what is their minimal number of instances they wanna run, maximum number. As part of the certification, the teams have to demonstrate that they understand all these underlying technology. So each team is required to test their performance. So one team came in to the certification and they low tested, they performance tested their current usage up to 150%, 150 times the current usage. So for example, they had like 20 concurrent users. So they tested up to 300 or 3000 users, right? So their pot scaled up to 10. And then when they realized that they, they really don't need 10 pods maximum. So they set it back to four or, or two or three pods to support their typical load of 20, but they have full control over this. And then the other thing I wanna show is that uh, going back to the pipeline, so they have full control over here. I just stopped at QA. They have control over deployment all the way to production, DR, DMZ, and so on. And for the demo purposes, I'm just gonna make, oh yeah. So the, these are the application config files um, that they can manage. For demo purposes, I have this um, sample function is a ping pong method. And then there's also a method to pull out some sample ratings. And what I'll do is, um, I'm gonna change the code here to, um, let's see, I will change the code here to, let's say CNCF ping pong. So imagine this is what the developers will go through to change the code or even put the code in the first time. And as part of the, the pipeline, we, it's gated release, right? We wanna make sure that your release ties to a story, right? So we are continuously delivering value, right? So then they will commit the code and then they'll do a pull request. So even within the pull request, so I will check into the October release. In here, we ensure that you must have code reviewers, right? So this is another gate that you must go through. And I'm just gonna, you know, for, I don't want Evan or, no, Evan can, can do it. I, I don't need anybody else to approve the code. So I'm gonna approve it myself. And then we'll set the automation um, to build the pipeline here. So that's gonna kick off the pipelines there. So we can go in and, and take a look at this. So the pipeline, what it does is um, it's gonna start with a snapshot build. So you can see all the outputs of these. So we do a snapshot build first is to ensure that the container image will actually build, right? The Java code will build. Because if that fails, there's no point deploying anything to, to Knative. So we'll just fail it right away. So here we're doing a snapshot build. So it's gonna do a Maven release. It's gonna do a, um, a, a Docker build as well. So and we, and your developers don't need to figure out how to set this up, right? This is just from a template that you, that's, that's already right. published, that's and right. they can go in and adjust it later if they need to, but they don't. But just to get started, you've published templates. That's right. If you, if you see this parameter in the template, so all of these are part of that um, initial automation that we create the reference implementation. This is for Java, and then all of that comes out of the box. So you see, this is all based on a template. So it's GitOps, right? So they use template out of the box and they can control all these different parameters within it for their pipeline. Good point, Evan. So in this case, the snapshot build is successful. And after that, it's gonna run a, a build to deploy to dev environment. And you have certain controls, right? This is one I did earlier. So for example, you can, we don't need to deploy to QA, right? So we just, we can just reject it. So QA has a manual step where somebody has to approve it. You know, they have to make sure that you have enough code coverage. QA will accept the, that build. So in that case, if for my demo, I just I stop that. Um, so for here, we're doing a build and deploy to our dev environment. So remember we have 
this configuration here that for dev, it's gonna do a very simple, right? For time's sake, we're just gonna do a build and we're gonna take that image and deploy it into Knative into the dev environment. Oh yeah, and then here, here's that dev environment. Um, so I'm gonna watch that. So it is currently running and this thing is gonna show us that it will deploy the new one. Right, so it's, this is running currently in our dev environment. Um, while this is running, do you wanna show any of the instrumentation or logging? Oh yes. You get out of the box. That's right. Good point. So for the instrumentation, every function that we release out of the box is a monitor, right? So you can have health monitoring of your function. So remember I talked about blue green. So this dashboard shows you what color we are, right? Because we don't want developers to be confused going to the wrong cluster. And typically we once we deploy one cluster, we shut down the other cluster so they won't get confused. So you have the developers have full visibility into the health of these um, the clusters and their their functions, right? You can have you can look at different namespaces, different functions. So full visibility out of the box. You don't have to you know care or I mean depending on how much you want to care, right? You if you just worry about the code, you don't have to care about how any of this stuff works. So we simplify it for you. But if you want to dig into the log, right? For example, this is that function. You have full visibility into the log. You can drill into it to see the log. And then the other thing is that out of the box, we have alerts enabled, right? This, you don't have to do anything. So this is the container health alert. This is log monitoring. So if you have errors, fatal errors, um, in the log, you will receive alert. Because in the onboarding, remember, you have to put in your contact information. And right? so that, we use that and, and set up the alert for you. And then this is more of um, Knative uh, related alerts. And if we go back to this, so, so the build is done. W what happens is after the Docker build, we will publish the artifact into Artifactory and that is used for uh, for the deployment into the dev environment. And, and you, I use, you use the same artifact for deploying to both dev and prod. That's right, that's right. So the same, so rem remember we did a snapshot, right? The snapshot is making sure that your build is clean. And then once we have that, if we remember this pipeline file, you will use the same artifact. You won't have to build again. You use the same artifact and deploy it all the way through. That, that will be your gold copy essentially. Yeah, and then, so this is, um, let's see how this is doing. So it's gonna start terminating it and then put in the new new code. And then the other thing I wanna show you is more around uh, time series data. So Prometheus gives us all the time series. So this is kind of a high level cluster level view. And then you can also view your functions and drill down to the health of each of your functions as well. So yeah. I won't, I won't give you too much information here. Um, so we'll go back to the deployment. So yeah, it's, uh, let's see. So this usually takes about three minutes. So it's deploying the service now. I think in here I put in the destroy command. Yeah, I put in the delete. So I'll de delete the previous deployment and then if you don't want to delete it, then it's going to just use out of the box rolling deployment. And we're also looking at blue green deployment for the functions as well. So that the functions have full control over different versions being deployed. When we look at the pipeline, so that's done. The pipeline is done and um, you see all the, I think this is a little delayed the message here. So you see it's- um, that's, it's the, that's the old container shutting down now. That's right, the old one is but shutting down. But your new down. one's up and running, so you should be able to show it off. Yeah, and the new one is, uh, is running. So if I go to here, this method here, it should show, yeah, CNCF ping pong, right? Remember that was a code change. So I'm gonna hit it a couple of times. So then we'll go to um, open tracing so we can see these things. 
So I hit this a couple of times. So if we look at the open telemetry, right, this is also out of the box. So you can see the, if you want to debug, right, if you can go trace these things. So for example, um, if we look at, yeah, you see how this is, uh, let's see, if we look at um, the traces, we're at 133, yes. So this is that ratings, right? We're putting, pulling back some sample ratings. You see this, there's a bit of a code start, right? So the first one took one second and then the subsequent one took milliseconds. So let's drill into it, right? So the first one you can see majority of the time is spent on Java, right? So this is your, this is your select statement database, which is pretty quick. But then if we look at this one here, this is your CRUD method pulling back all the data. So that took majority of time for one second. But then if we look at the other one, this is after the code start, right? So you look at this one, this total was um, nine milliseconds. And your select went faster too. Yeah, select went faster. Everything went faster the second time around. It, it took a little bit of warm up. Um, I, I didn't actually notice that. Uh, well, I, I did notice that, but I didn't see it until we had this in instrumentation in place, right? So developers also get this experience out of the box as well. So that's all I want to demo for today. So I will turn it over to Evan. Okay, you'll need to stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Oh, just one more slide. Okay. So this technology is very new and exciting, right? I think a couple of takeaways. One is that with that open contribution model, right? teams are able to come in and contribute and really get excited and get onboarded with this, right? So we have 90% of the application in scope for this year, meaning 90% of our application portfolio have either started or completed FAS function. So if we look at a team view, right? 50% of our teams, all of our teams have done FAS functions already, right? We're kind of sort of following this this adoption curve. We're towards the latter stages of adoption now. So this year- and This is less than nine forward. months from having had something to show them at all. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so Knative has really helped us on our journey because it simplifies the, the developer experience as well as the infrastructure um, experience with, uh, with using Kubernetes. All right, okay. I'll pass it to you, Evan. So, um, yeah, so, We've talked a bunch about, you know, oh, hey, S&P has built this fast platform and they're using Knative. But what does that actually mean? Um, so Knative is a system for building serverless HTTP applications. Um, so we've talked a little bit about serverless. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit here about why we do HTTP and then we're going to dig into more about how that serverless stuff works. Um, so when we were starting the project, um, it seemed pretty clear to us building an open serverless system that we wanted to build on some pretty robust standards. And HTTP kind of struck us as the obvious way to get requests in and out because it's well understood and it keeps evolving and improving. So it's not like we picked a standard and you know it's gonna be the same three years or five years from now. Um, it'll keep getting better. Um, support for things like W3C's tracing um, will just automatically get added in. And so all your tracing tools should work from front end to back end in the next year or two would be my guess as the, you know, as that ecosystem evolves. Similarly, we bet on Kubernetes for container scheduling um, because we knew that was going to keep improving and we wanted to be on the ocean where the tide was rising um, and that would lift our ship as well. Um, but we also wanted to specialize Kubernetes more than um, more than Kubernetes itself is sort of, um, here. here's a tool you can do anything with it. And you're like, I can do anything. Um, but you, most of the time you don't wanna do anything. You have a specific thing you wanna do. And so we wanted to make it a sharp specific tool for cases where you were building something that was basically a 12 factor application. Um, that you were willing to speak HTTP, that you didn't need to keep local state, and that um, 
we could make things a lot simpler. And so the first place this shows up is, um, I don't know how many of you define Kubernetes deployments on a regular basis. This is kind of the smallest, simplest deployment you could have over on um, the left-hand side. You've got a deployment, but if you want to talk to it, you actually also need a service and you need to have a bunch of selector labels and you need to match some ports and stuff like that. Um, and so you have at least two objects you've got to keep in mind and you have to think about labels. Um, there's actually a lot for a developer to dig into here because we haven't even really talked about like what's a Docker image. Um, over on the right hand side, you can see a Knative service. You basically say, you know, hey, this is a Knative service. That's the API version in kind. Here's its name. Um, run this container and it speaks HTTP. And then there's a bunch of convention and a little bit of magic in there. And you get some services that you don't get from a standard Kubernetes deployment, um, like an autoscaler. You could go and figure out horizontal pod autoscaler. Oh, look, we just added a little bit more YAML to the left-hand side. Um, so we mentioned autoscaling. Um, you sort of get this to some extent with ingress for management of HTTP host names. Again, we just added another object you have to think about um, to the Kubernetes space. So all those things are useful when you need to do something strange. You know, when you say, hey, I'm running a bunch of game servers. Each game server is kind of independent, but they're kind of together. Kubernetes is a great fit for that. Um, but if you're building HTTP applications, Knative simplifies that. Um, we also build in some tracking of previous states. Um, every time you do an update, it creates a new revision. So um, that's a little bit like what deployment does, but it's a little easier to find them and go back to the earlier ones. And there, um, the garbage collection policy can be date-based and, and over time without having to think about, um, you know, how many replica sets am I going to keep around? Um, Knative automates a lot of that. And um, we also automated a bunch of the rollout stuff between them. Um, deployment basically has one, has a policy that's, you know, hey, we'll just start restarting things. Um, and we'll get you up to the number you need. Um, and since we're serverless and we sort of start from zero, um, it's easy to just start a new pool and scale that up. And then the old ones go away when they need to. Um, so you may burst a little bit more if you want to switch things over quickly, but you can also um, do it much more slowly or get more control over HTTP. Um, also, since we knew, do, knew we were doing HTTP and we knew that it's 2020, um, we built in integration with Cert Manager and Let's Encrypt so that you can automatically also get all your SSL handled um, without developers having to get involved. And um, you can have just a single wildcard cert that covers all of your functions in all of your domains. Um, and let's talk a little bit now about how SP actually ended up using this. Um, so they talked about having blue and green environments. So you can see in the picture down at the bottom, um, you know, in their dev environment, they'd have cluster one and cluster two. And one would be blue and one would be green. And so they have a specific DNS zone, um, FAS blue or FAS, or FAS green, that lets you hit a specific one of these, um, you know, specific one of these clusters. They also have a top level DNS zone for the environment. So dev has a different domain than um, UAT or production. Um, and so if you don't want to have to think about, you know, are we in blue or are we in green, you can just hit that top level thing. If you need to go into details, it's there. Um, and they integrated with AWS Certificate Manager to do the provisioning. Um, out of the box, Knative ships with an integration with Let's Encrypt um, using Jetstack Cert Manager, um, which is great if you have an internet connected cluster and you don't need too many certs. Um, in the, you know, for, for a company like SP, they can afford to um, send a few dollars a, AWS's way to get um, to get higher rate limits and certain guarantees that Let's Encrypt just isn't set up to give. Um, their goal is to encrypt the internet, um, but not necessarily to run a financial business. So, um, you know, find the right tool and um, 
one of the goals from, with building Canadian was that you should be able to customize this stuff. So um, I think that was a success. And uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about what the data path looks like for Knative serving, because we've talked a whole bunch about it being serverless. And let's see what that actually means. So the first goal for handling requests, um, I call this life of a query. Um, it, I got my start at Google. And one of the first talks that you get is, here's what it looks like when you actually do a search query. So I always call it life of a query. Um, but the goal for steady state is that things should look pretty close to the same cost as if you were just using raw VMs or raw Kubernetes. So a load balancer splits stuff across your HTTP routing layer um, and stuff gets sent to a user container. Um, and that's all lovely and good. And then, so the next question is, um, you know, okay, lots of traffic comes in, you know, that goal of 3000 con concurrent users, for example, that Mark was talking about. Um, how do we actually count those users and then make sure that we've got the right number of containers? And Knative does this by injecting this little proxy in front um, of the user container and being able to count all the requests and feed that back into a request-based autoscaler. So if you're familiar with the Kubernetes um, horizontal pod autoscaler, by default, that will queue off of CPU or possibly off of a custom metric. Um, but you have to do a bunch of plumbing to get your custom metrics in there. Um, the default behavior of Knative is request-based scaling. If you want to, you can take out the Knato autoscaler and put in horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, it's possible to do. We find that most people actually like the request-based scaling. Um, so this is, you know, building a particular focus tool because we understand it's HTTP and we can get into the protocol. Um, let's see. Okay, so another thing that AWS Lambda gives you is um, you can write, well, in Lambda, you have to write, write your code um, with the assumption that it's, oh, there's only gonna be one request going on in a process at a time, because that's how Lambda works. Um, but lots of people actually like that, because it means that if you wanna have globals for stuff, or you just wanna know that you aren't gonna get interfered with anyone else, you have you know, a container that runs one request at a time. We want to support that in Knative. So QProxy also lets us enforce, hey, you know, you may have 50 HTTP routers, but you're only going to get one request per container at a time. You can also crank that up if you want to. You can say, hey, 50 or 100, you know, look, I've written this in Java, it's all reentrant. Um, you know, let it go to a thousand or keep it at one. Um, and the default is to assume it's it's reentrant, but it's easy to just say, you know, one request per container. Um, so now, now, you know, okay, that's all nice, kind of nice ergonomics. Um, how does that scale from zero thing work? Because there's nothing actually running. How can we count how many requests there are when a request comes in? Um, so this is where um, one of the clever tricks of Knative is that we run a single activator for your entire Kubernetes cluster or possibly a replicated set of them, but a small number, when you add a new function, it doesn't add a new activator. Um, the activator is shared and it will pause the request and it'll say, hey, um, there's no instances of this. Kubernetes, please go talk to Kubelet and actually get a pod ready. And once that pod's ready, then the activator will forward the request along. So you'll see um, a longer response time for those requests, but they won't get dropped on the floor. And um, so we've talked about, okay, we had zero, we want many, how do we get there? Um, how do we do the opposite? No requests have come in and we've shut down. Um, it turns out that actually takes a little bit of a clever dance as well, because first you need to add the activator in. After the activator is hooked in and the HTTP routers all know about it, then you can scale things down to zero the rest of the way. Um, and Knative tests and handles all of that, so you don't have to think about it, and you don't have to build anything complicated, and you get scale to and from zero. And the last part is, um, Mark talked a little bit about blue-green deployments and progressive rollouts, and we wanted to support um, being able to say, hey, this is a new canary thing. We're only going to give it 10% of traffic. 
even in that case that Mark was talking about where they have only 20 users, maybe you only want to do 10% of traffic anyway so that you tell people reload a few times and it should work. Um, but you only have four pods. Um, so with standard Kubernetes services, they're all round robin. And if you do replace one pod, it's a 25% rollout. Since we control that HTTP router, we can actually, and it's, it's something Envoy based um, so far, we can actually replace things in there and um, say do 10% and 90%. Um, and I just kind of hinted at this one. We support multiple HTTP routers. So Contour, um, Istio, Ambassador, Glue, and um, Red Hat wrote a really lightweight one called Courier that's specifically focused for being used by Knative. Um, we want to integrate with your HTTP router. We don't want to tell you, oh, you've made a big investment in Istio Mesh or you've made you know, a big investment in Glue or Contour or something like that. Sorry, throw it all away. Um, so we have adapter layers for all of these and you can choose which one you want to install. And I'm going to blaze through this because I have one minute left, maybe. Um, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so the mental model for Knative is, I showed you that service. A service is made up of a route, which is the networking part, and a configuration which tracks um, basically how you want things to run. And the configuration creates additional revisions um, every time you update it. Um, the route lets you pick which thing receives traffic. It can either be the latest revision or a specific revision. Um, we call running with the latest revision at 100% YOLO mode. You only live once. Um, but it's also really handy for, for development and um, you know, stuff that's not really critical. And that's the end. Um, we're available for questions and anything else that, you know, feel free to use the Q&A or chat or stuff like that to get in touch with us. And we've got contact info afterwards. Um, VMware is hiring, um, I should probably add. Um, we are looking for people to add to the Knative community and to hire them. So uh, feel free to reach out to me, um, Twitter DM or uh, email. And I don't know if S&P is hiring, Mark? We are. I'm actually currently looking for two blockchain developers. And by the way, blockchain is running on Kubernetes too. So. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Ivan and Mark for a great presentation and demo. So we have now some time for question. If you have some question around this topic, yeah, feel free to drop in your Q&A tab. Okay, we got a one question just came up. Who, uh, who will take this one? I can take that one. Um, I'm going to answer it live. Um, the question is, is there a significant difference in responsiveness between auto-scaling with Knative versus the horizontal pod auto-scaler? Um, as always, the answer is going to be, it depends. Um, I will say that the, um, the Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler may be, um, I don't know what knobs there are to tune how frequently it's checking to decide if it should rescale an application. Um, I know that the Knative autoscaler team um, looks at that and has tests that are basically hey, we're at zero. What happens if we dump 1,000 requests per second on a Knative cluster with you know, container concurrency set to 100 or something like that? So how fast do we get to 10, instant, you know, to the 10 or 12 instances that we should have for handling that much load? Um, and uh, so they have a pretty fast um, cycle on the metrics collection. And they've recently migrated that to gRPC from HTTP to get additional efficiency benefits because they were finding that for large clusters, it was too slow. Um, uh, I haven't seen HPA measurements, so I can't tell you HPA is going to be slower, but my suspicion is that it's probably not tuned to check as fast. And you may be able to tell it, you know, check every second or check every two seconds. Thanks for the answer. Okay, I think uh, you I'm, I'm assuming that Mark, um, that S&P is using the default autoscaler 
the K native one and not yes, we have horizontal pod auto scale. And we have a demo of it where we just scaled it up to 100 pods in like seconds. It was very efficient. Um, the goal when we started K native was um, to be able to match Lambda's performance eventually. And that's going to take more effort and getting down into um, Kubernetes as well. Some of the limitations we see today um, are around things like how long does it take to schedule a pod and pull the image. Um, and so I think that there are one or two caps that are percolating about how do we make that faster. Um, for example, readiness probes. If you use the Kubernetes readiness probe, you've got a minimum of a second for your service to become ready. And we'd like that to be um, below a second, you know, every 100 milliseconds or so. Um, and currently, the activator goes and does that um, check even on unready members of the service to see if it can, can race and beat um, Kubernetes propagation time on services. I think one of the things uh, with Knative is that with Lambdas and Azure functions of the world, you're very limited. Right? With Knative, we can do so much. We, we have full control over what we put in there. And we're even talking about, uh, with Pivotal, about trying to put a power builder in there. Because <laughs> we have legacy apps, right? We want to modernize. And there are different ways of modernizing. It gives us a lot more flexibility, basically. Because it, it's in our full control and we can do whatever we want with it. <laughs> and it's multi-cloud. Another great example of that is Doug Davis has a prototype that he's trying to figure out how to, how to fit into the community for being able to just have a shell script that gets adapted to an HTTP server. Um, so your container just has a shell command in it, you know, it is a shell container and then um, inject an HTTP server binary through a volume mount rewrite the entry point so that it calls that HTTP server and the HTTP server invokes your, your normal Docker entry point once for every HTTP request. Um, and it's a pretty cool demo and we're trying to figure out, okay, you know, how do we make it that next level of accessible to developers? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you guys are moving fast because we had a feature where we wanted to support S3 for IAM roles and that, that was, you know, we put in the request through GitHub, and then that was released to us very quickly. So quick turnaround on it. It's definitely been an interesting, oh. Uh, there's another question, so I'll stop just convincing. Um, what percent of compute or app estate could go to Knative or serverless ultimately? Um, uh, I'm gonna pass that over to Mark first to talk for S&P, and then I can have some unfounded opinions about the state of the industry. Yeah, so from our experience, there are, other than the commercial office shell, right? If you think about breaking capabilities, so we are more mapping capabilities, right? And then even the first stage is almost like cut and paste. Like you take your Java code, cut and paste into your .NET code. But then when we look at it, right, what percentage it really depends on what percentage of your apps, you know, what, what is the current state and the target state. So target state for us is 100%, right? Other than the commercial off the shelf, we can move into. You know, the, because it's container based, so we have a lot of flexibility in terms of what we put into Knative, right? It's HTTP, right? I've, I've also moved some commercial off the shelf stuff um, to a serverless environment if it, um, mm -hmm. if it can be containerized and, and is, you know, stateless containers. Um, yeah, we are actually. So we moved Pega, Documentum, uh, we are moving Documentum into uh, containers. It's a bad idea. I ran Jira once like that, but it turns out that Jira keeps a bunch of local caches. So um, that was an unsuccessful final experiment because your issues wouldn't show up until um, somebody told it to re-index. Um, so. so I would say if you have off-the-shelf off software, try it. Um, you may discover that, there's, that, that it's not successful, but um, some of it actually does work pretty well. Um, in terms of overall, um, I would say that Knative, specifically the current Knative serving, um, 
might be about 30% of sort of all workloads, um, where all workloads could also include stuff like, you know, databases and storage and stuff. I think there's other places where things could get more serverless than they are today. Um, looking at stuff, um, you know, a system like Pulsar or um, Kafka or ActiveMQ that scaled out just automatically from one node to many without having to think a lot about how many partitions do I have would be a really cool serverless, you know, distributed log system. Um, and I'd love to see one of those. Um, follow up question is, is state an issue here? How does Knative deal with it? So Knative and a lot of the serverless platforms today um, are, um, are stateless, like 12 factor. And the assumption is you can start two or five or 10 instances. And when you don't need them, you can just shut them down. So if you need to have state or shared state, um, using something like Memcache or Redis, if you need lightweight stuff, or just using you know, your database to share state or an object store to share state, um, keeping state in your process or on disk, not such a good idea. So um, don't do that. Uh, and then there's a question about plans to support fast and Knative on ESXi through Project Pacific. Well, so two answers. Um, you can run Knative on TKGS clusters today. Um, that works. Um, we use it for some of our internal testing. Um, in terms of product plans, I'm going to have to point you back to um, a v VMware product manager. Um, Valentina Alaria would be probably the best, but feel free to send me email and I can connect you um, with the right VMware product managers because I don't, I mostly focus on the open source software and I don't keep track of VMware's product plans. One thing I want to add, so we have, uh, other than HTTP, we also have uh, cron jobs. We have uh, messaging, uh, like eventing, I showed in one of the slides. And we also have static web UIs, kind of like you would with uh, hosting user interface on S3. So we have all those running in Knative as well. I think we had some TCP use cases. I have to, I have to dig that up. Um, oh. You mentioned TCP. Um, one of the fun things with Knative, if you're a network, if you were a networking geek, is um, we actually support HTTP, HTTP2, and WebSockets all at the same time, um, which is kind of a fun combination of spaces um, to talk about because uh, there's lots of different ways to stream things back and forth, even though you are just speaking HTTP. And that's one of the great things about having such a broad ecosystem to pick from. Um, and you can auto scale, you know, streaming responses, um, which is, you know, I've seen, I've seen good use cases for it. Um, I've also seen that start to bleed into the stateful space a little bit more than I'm comfortable with. So with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> And we are at time. I promised that things would go early, and apparently I've failed at that. But um, yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Feel free to, to follow up with questions on either Twitter or by emailing either of us. And thanks for attending. Yeah. So, OK. So or, yeah, any, any last word, Mark? Any Thank comment? you for having us. Yeah, perfect. So, all right. And that's all the questions we have time for today. And thanks for joining us once again. The webinar recording and slash that will be online later today. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you at the future CNC webinar. But also we have uh, uh, KubeCon and Cloud Navy Con North America next month and November 17. And we are looking forward to seeing you once again. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. And there's no capacity limits on that because it's virtual. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for having you guys good and uh, have a good rest of the day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.